Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Yevamot Lamed Hey. Uh, we're going to finish the third parak today, start the fourth parak. Um, I hope you'll feel like you can breathe a little better because you'll see that these sugyot, and not to say that we're not going to get back to some of the Yevamot and all the different relationships, but the daf, the dapim are definitely getting more to the, the standard dapim of Gemara that we are more familiar with. Okay, we're starting with the end. I'll repeat the, the last part of yesterday's daf, um, which is, one second, um, Okay, the last part of yesterday's daf, we saw Shmuel. And we're now going to see two different versions of Shmuel. We're going to have a lot of mirroring today, where we're going to kind of see the same thing, but in a bit of a different version, um, in a bunch of different ways, uh, just happens to be coincidental. In today's daf, there's a lot of them. So Shmuel in yesterday's daf, we were talking about this waiting period of three months, which again happens in many, many instances, where in order to determine who the future child may be, we make sure the woman waits three months so that right before getting remarried, after let's say getting divorced, her husband dying, we want to wait that period of time so that we know that if she ends up having a child, we'll know who the child is. It's not a seven month baby. You know, otherwise it'll be a concern. Maybe it's a seven month baby to the to the new husband or a nine month baby to the old husband, and we won't know who the child actually belongs to, which has all sorts of ramifications. So Shmuel makes this comment, which we're not exactly sure what it's referring to and kind of who's excluded. We'll, we'll see. Vikula, now starting six lines from the bottom of yesterday's staff. We learned this already, but we'll review. Vikula, all kind of situations. We don't really know what he's referring to yet. Have to wait three months other than a giyoret umeshukharet ktana. Other than a minor who is either a convert or is a, a slave who ended up becoming freed um, from slavery, right? Remember, this is a Canaanite slave or uh, an Oveid Kochavim slave who eventually becomes, right, when they become your slave, they become somewhat Jewish. When they get free, they become fully Jewish. So before she can get married to a regular Jew, which she's now allowed to, she has to wait three months. So here, if she's a Ketana, she doesn't. So if they're minors, remember, we learned already that minor girls, according to the rabbis, couldn't get pregnant, right, under the age of 12. So now they say, But if she's a minor who's a Jew, she has to wait the three months, which we're going to have to figure out why. But before we figure out why, we're going to have to figure out in what scenario. So if it's that she did miyun, that her mother or brother married her off, and then she right betrothed her, and she just wanted to get out of that marriage, and she's allowed to by just saying, I don't want to be here. Hamar Shmuel, the Lobaya, Shmuel already told us in a different situation, she doesn't need to wait three months. The Ibeget, because she's a minor. Ibeget, if it's a divorce, he already said she needs to wait the three months. If it's from divorce, right? Miun is a unique halacha that it's not even like she's really divorced. But once she's divorced, she actually has to wait the three months, even though she's a minor and even though there's really no concern she's pregnant. And that we're going to see when we see the other case where, where Shmuel obviously meant it here. It, it's because we're worried that if we allow her to get remarried, we might accidentally allow women who are of age to get married as well immediately. And therefore, it's what we call a gzera, right? We forbade this because of that. But in any case, even if that's what Shmuel's referring to, it doesn't make any sense because Shmuel, there's this concept. Shmuel told us somewhere else. He's obviously not telling us the same thing he already told us. So therefore, it can't be get, even though that would work, it would make sense, but it can't be because he already said that a different time. Where do we know he said this? Damar Shmuel, because he said, He said exactly that. You don't need to if you refuse to be married to this, woman, this man. You say, not interested. You get out of the marriage, you can get married tomorrow. But get, you need three months. In which case, when Shmuel said it here, he couldn't possibly be referring to that. So therefore, they say, It must be that now, whether she was engaged in prostitution, or maybe this means she just slept around with somebody. So it's that kind of situation that he said she needs to wait three months. Because, and why? The rabbis made a because she's a minor. And even though she's a minor, because you might confuse the situation. And if people see that she did this, then they might think a gdola can do it. And therefore, we don't allow it. Again, not just she doing it, meaning the court allowed her to, or the rabbis allowed her to. They might think a gdola doesn't need to wait. And they were very concerned about that issue. So according to this version of Shmuel, he was gozel. They made a, they made a takana that even minors 
if it's prostitution, and obviously also get, it's just that wasn't what his comment was about. Okay, so now the Gemara asks, Umigaz rinak tana mishum gdola? Really, we do this? Why? And and not only why, but we're going to see from our Mishnah that we don't make a gzera on the ketanot. What did it say in our Mishnah? Remember our crazy case? Two brothers betrothed two sisters and then went home with the wrong one, slept with the wrong one, and then we say, if she was a gdola, you have to wait three months because maybe she got pregnant. We had the whole discussion yesterday. How could she have gotten pregnant if it was she was a virgin? And then we now say, if she, the Mishnah said, if she was a ketana, she can get go back to her original husband right away without a problem. So now the Gemara says, So if we have a reason to be gozer ketanot atu gdolot, why didn't we? Why weren't we gozer in our Mishnah? Why did our Mishnah our Mishnah distinguish between the two cases? So Amar of Gidal Amarav he answers a very strange answer. It was a one-time event, and they made a gzera in the case of our Mishnah as a one-time event, but they weren't, it wasn't something that was going to happen very often, and it wasn't something that was going to be for generations, and you know, no, it was a one-time thing. So now, think about our Mishnah. What was our Mishnah? Our Mishnah was a case, a theoretical case. If two men betrothed two women, and they mixed them up, and blah, 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 right? we didn't think this was an actual case. Hora'at sha'a means, right, it's when all sorts of things they explain as a hora'at sha'a, like sometimes in the Nivim things happen and you're like, what? How could that be? And they say, oh, it was hora'at sha'a, they had to do it. Or, or sometimes the Gemara brings a story of something that happened in the time of the Tana'im and they say, oh, it was hora'at sha'a. It basically means it was a one-time thing, very unlikely that thing will happen again. And they made, you know, there was a reason at that moment they had to decide to do that and uh, don't worry about it. So the Gemara asks, are you trying to say that situation actually happened? Right. This is when when you're all looking and saying that's an absurd case. What would it really happen? Even the rabbis say what that actually happened. That, that wasn't a case. That was a theoretical case to discuss all these possibilities. It didn't actually happen. That you could say this was a hora acha and they said oh Tana wouldn't didn't need to get remarried. Uh, didn't need to wait to get re- go back to her husband because it was this one time thing. What, what are you talking about? So they say well. What we meant was, It's not that it was a one-time event. It's that the case in our mission is so theoretical that it's very unlikely going to happen. And if it does, it's certainly not a situation that we're worried that you'll take a lesson from there and learn to other cases. Because it's such a unique case and it's so unlikely that it's going to happen that when cases are unlikely going to happen, we don't make a gzera. So that's why our mission says that if... For whatever, you know, if by chance this case should happen to happen, you can let the Ketana get married right away because we're not worried that you're going to learn from here to other things. Or even if we were worried, the rabbis don't institute their Gzerot in a case where it's unlikely. So this is a very unlikely case. Okay, there you have it. The Gemara has admitted that some of the cases they bring up are very unlikely to happen. And therefore, there's no reason. That's the whole first version of Shmuel. But now... We're going to bring a different version of Shmuel. Lishana Achrina Ambrela. There are other people who bring a different, a different wording of what Shmuel said. And here goes. Amar Shmuel. Kulan Srikolam Tin Shloshach Hodashim. Chutzmi Giyoret Umishukhrechet. So far it sounds the same, right? Three months, except for a convert and a freed slave, a maid servant, or a maid slave. Gdola. Naktana. In the first case, we said, oh, we're not goes around the Giyorin and Tana, right? And there you could say maybe, right, we're goes around a regular Jewish woman, Atu Gdola, but Meshukhwerit and, and Shifra, I'm sorry, Meshukhwerit and Giyorin are in a different category. We don't need to worry about their Ketanot. We don't need to make a Gzera for our Gdolot because that's a unique case. But what, but here he says, even a grown woman, okay, who's a Giyorin and Meshukhwerit doesn't need to wait three months. But not, right, sorry. Um, now, if that's the case, basically Shmuel saying, don't need to wait the three months. And also, okay, there's a, whether this word aval appears or not, but also a ketana, who's a Jewish ketana, doesn't need to wait three months either. Okay, when you talked about the Meshukhwaret in the previous, they were the ketanot, and then kind of they were exceptions to the rule. Only those minors don't need to wait. In this version, 
they don't need to wait if they're gedolot. But no ktanot ever need to wait. And that fits very nicely with the fact that ktanot don't generally um, get pregnant, right? They, or they don't get pregnant, according to the rabbis, ever. And therefore, there's no reason to worry about the three-month period. So now again, though, they say, we have to go back to the statement of Shmuel. Remember Shmuel said, Mi'un, you don't need to wait if they refuse. If it's a get, they do need to wait. So we're going to again ask, Bimai, what is Shmuel referring to? And again, it's going to be the same as the last one, but with a minor change, because it'll have to be, right, last time we said if it's get, he already said they need to wait three months. This time it's going to be if it's Mi'un, he already said they don't need to wait, because now Shmuel saying Tana doesn't need to wait, and if it's Mi'un, that's the case he already said, Chadazim. Right? Shmuel already said, if you do miyun, you don't have to wait three months. So he, it doesn't make sense. He would say it again here. He wouldn't repeat himself. And Ibe get, it can't be get, they don't need to wait because Shmuel actually said they need to wait. Hakam Shmuel Debaya, that he already said they need that waiting period. So again, we're going to say, right, and now we're going to bring the statement Shmuel said, just to, just in case you didn't know it, because assuming this version didn't really have the last version. This is where Shmuel said it, that if she refused to stay married, if she was under 12 and she, the mother or brother married her off and it was only a, a Kiddushin de Rabbanan, then Shmuel said she doesn't need to wait three months. And if he gave her a get, then she would need to wait the three months. So again, what do they say? Elab is nut. It must be znut. And znut biktana lo shachiach. What's the reason? This is the opposite of what we said before. Before we said znut, we make a gzeran znut. In this version, there's no need because how many minors are engaged in prostitution? Again, as soon as you say something is lo shachiach, not very common, then there's no need to make any sort of gzera. So therefore, they, they allow a ktana who, who is involved in znut to get married right away because it's a very uncommon case. And there's no reason to worry that if we allow it there, Right? Well, and, that's, and again, this idea of lo shachiach is even if maybe people would confuse the law and then think of Jola could get married right away, it doesn't matter. The rabbis just don't make zerot in cases that are super uncommon. It's just not the way it works. So now, what do we have left to explain? Why is the giyoret and mishochoreret, gedola, right? Why are they, why don't they need to wait three months? Don't we need to know, right? Maybe they slept the night before with somebody else before they converted. So they say, right, and if you're going to say the whole thing is lo shachiach, ki yorudum shochreret de shachiach behuznut. Okay, there's this assumption of the rabbis. Now you might say, certainly with our modern eye, that is not so appropriate to just say, oh, anyone not Jewish, likely they're engaged in prostitution. We would never say such a thing. But again, first of all, you have to remember the culture they lived in. And the culture they lived in, there really was in the, in the Roman world and the Greek world, there was a lot of prostitution going on and orgies and things like that. So it's actually not crazy for them to assume this assumption. Again, nowadays, well, you could argue whether it would be true or not true. And again, what do you call prostitution, right? So anyway, I'm not going to get into that whole thing. But the point is that you can assume that maybe they were sleeping around with somebody and therefore, Ligzor, they should forbid them. So why is a Giyor and Meshachar Gedola, why don't you have to worry about this three-month waiting period that maybe they're pregnant from before? So the answer, a very interesting answer. Huda Amar Ka Rabi Yossi. He holds like Rabi Yossi. Let's see Rabi Yossi. Detanya says in a bright time, Vashvuya, Vashifcha Shedifdu, they add another one to the category, which is someone taken into captivity, where there's a concern that, that they were raped in captivity. And a shifcha shenifdu, right? So we have the giyoret and the shifcha that was redeemed. V'shenid gairu, v'shenid shachruru. Okay, so either they were freed, they were kept in captive and freed. They were a Canaanite slave that was freed, that became Jewish, or a giyoret that converted. Tzrichot lantin shlosha chodeshim divrei Rabbi Yehuda. Now that's not the opinion we're looking for. We're looking for someone who says they don't need to wait. Rabbi Yossi, who's the one we're going to hold by, matir le'ares u'linasem yad. So we basically say, Shmuel must be holding like Rabbi Yossi. It's very nice, but it doesn't really give us an answer as to why. So comes Rabba. I'm a Rabba. My time is Rabbi Yossi. Rabba explained Rabbi Yossi's explanation, right, Rabbi Yossi's opinion, which is then going to explain Shmuel, because Shmuel holds like Rabbi Yossi. There's an assumption 
that these women who are sleeping around are going to use birth control, okay? They put in a moch, which is, you know, they put something physical in their body, okay, like a tampon type thing, which is going to stop the semen from going into their bodies in order to prevent them from getting pregnant. Now, the question is, why can we assume that they use birth control? So, I'm going to buy it. I understand there's a woman who's converting. Now, people don't convert in a minute, right? They go through a process. So, a woman, within three months before her conversion, she already knows she's planning to convert. So, I understand why she's going to be using birth control. Because she's planning to convert. She protects herself. She wants to distinguish, she wants to basically get pregnant when she's already converted. Because she wants to have that zera be Jewish from the start rather than right, a woman who's pregnant. When she converts, she goes in the mikvah, the tefillah actually counts for the child. Okay, the child still, let's say it's a male, needs a brit milah when they get out, but they're, but then basically the tefillah is done. So theoretically, the child will be Jewish no matter what. But they say that child will be a, considered a convert rather than a born Jewish. What's the relevance? So one of the things that's the most relevant is that, again, what do we say? Like newborn. So that means that they're not related anymore to their relatives. So if she has children after that, they'll all be siblings with each other, but this child won't be considered a blood sibling, right? Like a sibling halachically of the other children and she'll want, you know, she'll want them to be. So she'd rather, that's possibly one of the reasons why she'd rather wait to have the child born with Dusha. You could say maybe also just in her mind, it just, you know, it feels more right for her. Maybe there's no halachic issue involved. So there's an assumption that she's not going to get pregnant right before she converts. And that's why we're going to assume she's using birth control. What about the Shvu Yavashifcha? Also, Nami, Deshani Mimarayu Mantarein Afshayu. We assume the one woman in captivity is going to know that she's, um, that she's, um, bam, right, that she's going to be freed, and the Shifcha is going to know that she's going to be freed. Okay, that's interesting. I don't know if you knew three months in advance, but the assumption is they know that this is, they're nearing the end, and therefore they're also going to protect themselves. But, Yosef Bashem Ba'ayin Hechemishkachala. But someone, this is a classic thing with a, you have a slave. If you accidentally knock out a tooth or injure their eye or something like that, they, right, you, you break a bone in their body, they go free. So now that's something they have no way of anticipating that they're going to go free. So maybe they have relations and didn't use birth control because they didn't know that they were about to be freed. So, maybe in that case, Rabbi Yossi will agree with Rabbi Yehuda that you have to wait for three months. Not true. But none. It says in the Mishnah, If you were raped or seduced, you need to wait three months. Now, rape, obviously, you have no way of knowing what's coming. You have no way of using birth control. So, how could you say that, right? Here, Rabbi Yossi clearly thinks something that comes upon you unexpectedly. You still don't have to wait three months. So, what's the reason? Alamar Abaye. So, Abaye changes a little bit about what we said before. And he says, Isha mizana mitapechet shelo titaber. Okay, this is an interesting method of birth control. She flips over in order to have the semen come out of her body so that she doesn't get pregnant. So now, and that's something you could do after, that's something you would do if you were raped, right? That you would try to come up with, right? There are ways that people, right? You can put something in after, right? There's certain methods that not are not foolproof, not that any method of birth control is foolproof, but there's an assumption that even if it comes unexpectedly, Rabbi Yossi assumes that you're going to use a birth control, some sort of method, you're going to turn over and try to have it come out so that you won't get pregnant. And that's why we don't have to worry. Okay, so all of these people were going to assume that they've done that. The Edach, why don't the rabbis agree with this? Because they say it might not work. So therefore, you still have to worry. You still have to wait the three months. That's why Rabbi Yehuda really disagrees with Rabbi Yossi. Okay, so that we have the two versions of Shmuel, whether the main difference is, does he think a Ketana, if she was Mazne, right, she had a relationship out of marriage, does she need to wait the three months before getting married? Even though she can't get pregnant, we might be gozil because of a gadola. Or do we say no?
Okay, and then that affects also whether we say a giyoret, a meshukheret, ktana doesn't need to wait, but a gdola would need to wait, or maybe even a gdola doesn't need to wait according to Shmuel in the second version, because we assume that they're using methods of birth control. Uh, by the way, the answer, I just want to point out, I didn't really figure out an answer to this, but the answer they give in the end that she turns over is very good for the rape case, but it's not really good for the shame va'ayin, because if she, let's say, had a relationship with someone a few weeks before, and then she's automatically yotzei b'shem va'ayin, it's too late to use that method of birth control, right? And we assume she didn't use it before, so it's not a perfect answer. Okay, last part of this before we finish this chapter, and the last part of this Mishnah, the last line wasn't really so clear. If they were koanot, which sounds like the daughter of a kohen, then they can't eat truma. So what does this mean? So first the Gemara says, koanot in Yisraeli lo. Sounds like if they were Yisraelite, they could continue eating truma. So that doesn't make any sense. Ema, so you should say, Ema you nishe koanim. What it means is if they were the wives of koanim. So if they were a wife of a Kohen, they can no longer eat truma because they slept with, right? They were a married woman who slept with someone in between. Then they're exempt. They're um, disqualified from eating truma because of that. Even though it wasn't their fault, still they become disqualified from truma, just like they have to get divorced from their husbands also, we learn. So now they say, wait a minute. Neshe Kohanim in, Neshe Yisraelim lo. What do you mean? What if they were married to Yisrael? And then ended up getting divorced or their husband dies. And then they want to go marry a Kohen. They're also Nifsal in that case. Okay? And they're also Nifsal at Mitruma. Okay? How do we know this? So it doesn't matter what their status is now are they married to a Kohen or a Yisrael. It matters if they're interested in any point in their lives anymore in marrying a Kohen. They're going to have an issue because they had this problematic relationship when they were a married woman and ended up with some other man. So, this was said by Rav Sheshet, and you know, as Rav Sheshet told us, and I, I was, my, I was enlightened by learning it in our Mishnah as well. Okay, the wife of the Yisrael that was raped, even though she can go back to her husband, she can't ever marry a Kohen. Okay, so. Uh, right, because a Kohen can't marry a woman who was raped, basically. Again, raped from if she's already married. Okay, that's very important. Here it's talking about rape of an Eshet Ish, okay, of a married woman, not if it's rape of a non married woman. So, Amarava Hachikama, Imayu Kohanot, Nesuot Li Yisrael, Nifsuluminat Chuma de Bena Shayu. Now we go back to explaining Kohanot really means what the simple reading was. They're a Bat Kohen, but what's the issue? The issue is not what we saw before, which is they can't eat truma in their house because that even a wife of a, a a wife of a kohen and not necessarily even if she's the daughter of a kohen and daughters of kohen also might be married to a Yisrael. So what does this mean? This means if she's married, she's a bat kohen. She was married to this woman, this man. She ended up, you know, accidentally sleeping with his brother. Right? They got flipped at, at the wedding, and then what happens? Then he dies or he divorces her. She goes back to her father's house. Generally, the daughter of a coin can go back to eating truma in her father's house. This woman cannot ever go back to that scenario. She can't go back to eating truma in her father's house. She can live in her father's house, but she can't eat truma there. And with that, Hadron Alaf Arba'achim, and we're now starting the fourth chapter. So the assumption, based on what we just learned, really, is that after a husband, after a man dies, childless, now we're back to Yibum, and they want to do chalitza or yibum. They have to wait three months. Why do they have to wait three months? Okay, this mission is going to be premised on the assumption that you're supposed to wait three months to see maybe the wife is pregnant. Generally, they only knew people were pregnant after three months because then they started showing. They didn't have pregnancy tests like we have nowadays. So they would wait three months. And then they would see if she's pregnant, then they wait out the pregnancy to see is she giving birth. If she gives birth to a to a healthy baby and the baby survives the first 30 days, exempt from Yibam and Chalitza. Okay? If she doesn't survive the pregnancy, she has a miscarriage, she the baby lives for only for the, you know part of the first month, doesn't make it, that's called right, not a ben kayama, then she's actually going to be obligated in Yibam or Chalitza. And obviously, if the three months pass and she's not pregnant, then also Yibam and Chalitza are going to kick in. 
So in our case, in our Mishnah, we have a case where HaCholetz leaving to. He did Chalitza right away. He didn't wait. Vidinset me'uberet. And it turns out then, right, Pat, right he does, let's say he does it the first week, right? Some people like to get things out of the way and done. He does Chalitza. And now all of a sudden, a few months later, she becomes pregnant. Vyalda, and then she has a baby. Bizman shavlad shel kayama, if the baby makes it, meaning survives the first 30 days, hu mutar bikrovote, you have to remember this whole discussion of this mission was in a time, I mean, obviously we still have these things going on nowadays, but in those days, it was much more common that children would either write women but miscarry, children would die within the first 30 days. So now, hu mutar bikrovote, vihi mutar bikrova, velo psalam inakiwuna. So I see you're asking, what if one of the other wives, any of the wives found to be pregnant? It doesn't matter, okay? The question here is, what's the status of this chalitza? Is this chalitza valid or not, right? Now, what does it mean valid? So she's pregnant and the baby survives. So obviously they didn't need to do chalitza. So we basically act as if there was no chalitza done. Now, what's the ramifications? Remember we learned the chalitza is like divorce. Because chalitza is like divorce, we have all sorts of chumras about chalitza. So, for example, you become forbidden to all of her relatives. Okay, we're going to see this coming up. That he's forbidden to her relatives, she's forbidden to his relatives. We treat it like divorce. Okay? So now, maybe we didn't discuss this yet. It might be coming up. So now, and the other thing is, she's a chalutza. Now, what did we learn about a woman who's a chalutza? A Kohen can't marry a woman who's a chalutza. So now, right, I see you're writing, Miriam, exactly. So now, what do they say here? If the baby survives, and then there was no need for chalitza, then what the chalitza action was totally irrelevant. It was as if they never did chalitza. So he can marry her relatives, she can marry his relatives, right? He muterib bekrovat, the lop salam and akiwuna, and she can go marry Cohen if she wants, because it was as if there was no chalitza. But what if, ain havlad shal kayama, if the baby doesn't survive, it sounds like, and I say sounds like because we're going to see a bit of a different interpretation going through. Sounds like what? Sounds like the chalitza done originally was valid, right? And therefore, all the laws of chalitza kick in. What's missing here? Well, that she doesn't need to do chalitza again, right? But basically, it sounds like he can't marry her relatives, she can't marry his relatives, and she's because the chalitza was a valid chalitza. Okay, so even though, right, even though it went on the timeline, she did chalitza, then she was pregnant, which basically should have nullified the chalitza, but since the baby never made it, the chalitza retroactively was valid from the beginning. That's at least one way of reading this Mishnah. You're going to see that it's not so clear how to read this, but right now that's how we're reading it. What if he actually did Yibum with her? Now, here there's going to be more ramifications because if it turns out that there was a child, then they're going to be a little bit messed up because then she was never allowed to marry him in the first place and it's Esau Erva. So, right, because it's her his brother's wife he married. And then she turns out to be pregnant. Yelda, and she has a baby. They basically get divorced, but you don't even need to get because the whole yibum was totally invalid. And what is what happened? She married Eshet Achiv, right? Or, sorry, he married Eshet Achiv. He married the wife of his brother. She married her, right? Her She's now married to the guy who was her brother's, uh, her husband's brother. Forbidden for both of them to get married. Easter Karet. And then what do we always say? Kiddushin and Kiddushin Tovsim. There's no Kiddushin. So you don't even need a divorce, okay? But you basically separate immediately. The chayavim bekorban, and you have to bring a sin offering because you did something. It was by accident, but it was a big accident. Vim ein vlad shel kayama. If the baby never made it, you kayem. You can stay married. It was all again. Sounds like retroactively, it was all valid. Safek, and then you basically fulfill gibum. It sounds like already. Safek ben tisha l'rishon. Safek ben shiva l'acharon. What if we're not sure if the child born is? Ninth month, nine month baby. Let's say you you do the you do it two months later, and you now have a baby, and you don't know is it a seven month baby to the new husband or a nine month baby to the old husband, or it could be you know you got married the day after, and we don't know which one it is. The point is we just don't know who it belongs to. It's possible it could belong to the first husband. You'll see. So now you have an issue because maybe you needed to do yibum, 
but maybe you didn't. So because maybe you didn't, and maybe you're sleeping with someone, you, you know, you're, you're married to someone, you might not be allowed to be married to, we don't know, right? If the baby was born, then it's for, if the baby was the first husband, you're forbidden to be with this husband. So therefore, you'll see. But the Vlad is kasher, because no matter what, the child's not a mom's here. Because either it was the first husband, which is totally fine, or if it's not the first husband's, then you were obligated in Yibam, and then you did the right thing, and then the baby was born to the second husband. So either way, the baby's fine. There's no psul, there's no problem with the baby's yichus. Um, ba'asham taloi. And in this case, since they're not sure if they did Navera, you do what's called a hanging guilt offering. I'm not sure if that's the proper translation of it, but Asham Taloi is hanging, basically. It means this is something you bring if you're not sure if you did a, a, a sin that normally requires a chatat, a sin offering. You do this guilt offering, which is a hanging guilt offering. What does it do? Until such time that you figure out who the baby, right, or whether you did something wrong or not. In this case, you'll never figure it out unless you live nowadays and you could do DNA testing. But in those days, there was no DNA testing. There was no way to ever know. So what do you do? You want to get atonement for your possible sin, but it's not a definite sin, so you don't bring a sin offering. You bring this hanging guilt offering, which basically gives you atonement until such time that you actually figure out if you did something wrong. In the event that you figure out you actually did something wrong, you have to actually bring the chatat. But in this case, you'll never really find out. So your Hashem Taloi basically gives you atonement until such time that you die. Okay, so now we're going to start with the machloket in the, in the Gemara, in the, between Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish and the Gemara. And we're going to have to try to connect it to our Mishnah. We're going to bring, first we're going to learn their opinions. We're going to explain their opinions. Then we're going to um, bring the basis for their opinion. Then we're going to start bringing questions. And we're going to have different versions of, was the question that Rabbi Yochanan is Rish Lakisha? Was it a question of Rish Lakisha and Rabbi Yochanan? We're going to kind of read it all in the mirror image. So Itma, it was said, introduction to Machloket and Moraim. Which is basically a similar case. She miscarries. It doesn't really make a difference if she miscarries or the child is born and doesn't survive, okay, for, for these intents and purposes. If she miscarries, so again, he did the chalitza, then it turns out she was pregnant, then um, she miscarries. Rabbi Yochanan Amar, chalitza mina achim. Okay, I think someone just asked this question. So Rabbi Yochanan says, she's fine. She doesn't need chalitza anymore from the brothers because she already, her original chalitza took care of it, even though she really shouldn't have done it. And even though it turned out she was pregnant, which seemed to be that it would maybe undo the chalitza. No, retroactively, since the baby never happened, goes back to the original chalitza and it's fine. Rish Lakish Amar, Tzricha Chalitza Minachi. She needs chalitza. Now, by the way, it could be her, it could be a sister, right? Uh, I'm sorry, it could be another wife. But basically, they need to do chalitza again. That first chalitza didn't count. Now, this seems counter to the way we learned the Mishnah. And that's why I said very specifically when we learned the Mishnah, I'm reading it in one particular way because it's a simple way of reading the Mishnah. It doesn't really seem to go with um, Rish Lakish. Rish Lakish says, now, there's a big debate. I'm not going to get into it. When it says, Tzricha chalitza menachim, does it mean from the other brothers and she can no longer do chalitza with the one she did it with originally or even she could do it with the one she did originally. It's kind of off the daf, so I'm not going to go into it. But there is a machlok at exactly who she can do chalitza with in this case. Rabbi, so now we're going to explain. Rabbi Yochanan Amar, Eina Tzaricha Chalitza, Mina Achim, why? Because chalitza meuberet shma chalitza, ubiad meuberet shma bia. If you do chalitza when you're pregnant, it actually is valid. You do bia, you have relations with him to, to do the mitzvah of Yibam. It, it's effective, again. Only in the event that, in the end, the baby doesn't make it. But it is effective. That first one was effective. Okay? Rish Lakish Amar, Tzricha Chalitza Menachim. Because Chalitza Muberet Lo Shma Chalitza. Ubiat Muberet Lo Shma Bia. He says, that was totally invalid. It wasn't anything that you did because she was pregnant. And there's no Chiyav Yibum. So any Chalitza or Yibum that you did is irrelevant. So you have to start from the, from the beginning. So now they're going to say, but my come before you. What's the root of their Machlok? Some people say it's based on a pasuk. Some people say, right, on a trans, on an explanation, on a verse. Some people say it's based on logic. So we're going to start with the second one. First, Rabbi Yochanan Savar Im Yavo Eliyahu. Eliyahu, now Eliyahu is the one who always knows what we don't know. If Eliyahu were to come, the Yomal, right, at the moment you did Chalitza, before you knew she was pregnant, and he told you, mapla, he's, he's going to say, listen, by the way, the woman's pregnant, but she's going to have a miscarriage. 
So now, Mila bat chalitza v'yibumu, right? Wouldn't you be able to do yibum right at that moment? Or chalitza? Because you know that there's no child, basically. So hashanami, tigali milta the mafra. So since theoretically you could say that, we basically go back and we say, okay, so even though you didn't know that, but that's what basically happened. She was pregnant. She had a miscarriage. We, we just basically say whatever you did in the beginning, it's as if that didn't happen. Now, Rish Lakish, what's his logic? Rish Lakish, we don't say, now I was thinking about this in, a, in an emotional way, right? When a woman has a miscarriage, God forbid, right? It's not like you say, okay, I'm back to square one. So, you know, like I'm back to where I was a few months ago before I was pregnant. Of course you're not. You're a different person. You've gone through an experience that's traumatic. That's right. You can't just undo that whole thing. There was potential for life. The the husband almost, right, didn't need to do yibum. Yes, she miscarried, but we don't just look at it as if this never happened and we just go back and say, okay, Chalitza was fine. No, there was a potential for life here. That meant that you weren't actually obligated in Yibum Yim. So when you did Yibum and Chalitza, it wasn't anything because you weren't really obligated. Now, you didn't know that you weren't obligated. You thought that she wasn't, you didn't even think that she was pregnant, but that's really not considered anything. Ibait uh, Emakha. Some people say it's a verse. Rabbi Yochanan Savar Uben Enlo. Amarachmana. It all depends. Does he have a son? Does he not have a son? Rabbi Yochanan looks very matter of fact. In the end, he didn't have a son, right? It's true. He had potential for a son, but there was no son. So in the end, the Chalitza was valid because in the end, really, he didn't have a son. Rishlakish Saval, Uben Enlo, again a lot. Remember we saw this? Look and see. Maybe there's a son somewhere out there. Meaning at this point, there was potential for life. So at that point, if you had looked, you didn't look. You didn't see that she was pregnant. But if you had looked well and you had checked, she was pregnant and there was potential for life there. And therefore, your chalitza was totally invalid because you didn't do that. You didn't really check. So now we're going to start with our Mishnah and use our Mishnah to basically support Rabbi Yochanan because that's what our Mishnah seems like. So look at our Mishnah. Our Mishnah said, if the Vlad is not, doesn't survive, who has to write the fetus? Right then, the chalitza is a valid chalitza. So, he's focusing on the part about psalam and akiuna. Why is she disqualified from from kiuna at that point? Because, because what? Because the chalitza is a good chalitza. That's why. But you say the chalitza wasn't relevant at all. So why can't she marry a Kohen? Her chalitza was meaningless according to what you're saying, Rish Lakish. So Armale, what's Rish Lakish's answer? Why is she disqualified from Kiuna? Uh, it's just a Chumrah. Really, her chalitza was invalid. But what? Well, she actually did an act of chalitza. And what does that look like to the outside world? The outside world maybe won't know that in the end she was pregnant and had a child and the child just didn't make it. They might not see that, but they did see that she did chalitza. So because of that, they'll think that a chalitza can marry a Kohen, right? We don't want people thinking that. So therefore, they made a chumrah here. So that's Rish Lakish's answer. Now we're going to do the mirror image. We're going to take Rish Lakish. We're going to say, Igadamre. Some people say that Eitve Rish Lakish to Rabbi Yochanan. Rish Lakish is going to question Rabbi Yochanan from our Mishnah. Now this is a little more difficult because it's not the way we read the Mishnah that it kind of fits with Rabbi Yochanan. So here he's going to say the following. Ain of Lad Shal Kayama, same line. Who has to recruit Vatav? Upsalam in a Kuna. So now he says, and I gave you a little bit of a hint to this when I read the Mishnah. Bishlama Lididi de Amina Chalitza Mubere Loshma Chalitza. Hainu de Katani, Psalam in a Kuna. What elements are they focusing on? She can't marry his relatives, he can't marry her relatives, and she's disqualified from Kuna. And that's all Lechumra. Those are all just Chumras. But what doesn't it say there that basically disproves your point, Rabbi Yochanan? It doesn't say she doesn't need to do chalitza again, okay? Which Rish Lakish takes that to mean she does need to do chalitza again. In other words, we're going to be machmir and don't allow her to marry Cohen, but of course she needs chalitza. That was invalid. According to you, Rabbi Yochanan, the main halacha here is that her chalitza was valid. If her chalitza was valid, she doesn't need chalitza from the other brothers anymore, from even that brother anymore again. I told by the on the machloka, how you understand that machloka we shown him. But the point is, it should have said the words, she doesn't need chalitza. 
That would have been a better way to say it. So, Amrle, Rabbi Yochanan says, Inachinami, it obviously means she doesn't need chalitza. Why didn't it say it? Well, I did Tane Resha lo psala, Tane Sefa psala. The first case, when the baby d- does make it, we said, she's not psulam in a kiuna. Right? Obviously, it doesn't say there anything about chalitza, because obviously she doesn't need chalitza. There's no chiyuv chalitza anymore. So, therefore, in the second part, it said psala, basically says for literary reasons, this is the structure of the Mishnah, and that's why it pointed out the psalam and akuna, and not the chalitza part. But obviously, it meant you don't need to do chalitza. Second question of Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish, and again, we're going to have his, his asking Rish Lakish using that, and then Rish Lakish flipping in the second version and using it against Rabbi Yochanan. Eitzvei Rabbi Yochanan the Rish Lakish, en avlad shal kayama yikayim. In the case where you did yibum, and then you find out she's pregnant, and then the baby doesn't make it anymore, you can stay married. According to me, who thinks that this will all keep going. So, that's why it says, Okay, so I see I might have, might have frozen, so I'm going to go back for a minute. Rabbi Yochanan asks Rish Lakish the following question. He says, when it says in the Mishnah, you can stay married. So it comes Rabbi Yochanan, he says, this makes perfect sense to me. Who says, Chalitza is valid retroactively, and that's why you can stay married because you already did yibum. Just stay married. But you say it's not valid retroactively. What should it have said in the Mishnah? It should have said he has to go and have relations with her again in order to fulfill the mitzvah of yibum, and then he can stay married to her, right? But it should have said that. So it comes from Rish Lakish and says, ah, that's not a question. My Yikayen, what does Yikayen mean? Yachzor viv ov Yikayen, delo sagi. And some people say, delo sagi belav hachi. There is no other possibility, according to Rish Lakish. She says, what possibility do you have? So Rashi explains, if you look at the Rashi, about eight, ten lines from the bottom of the page, delo sagi belav hachi, why? De imif tira belo bi'a la'achar shipila, if she doesn't do bi'a afterwards, again, this is all Rish Lakish's. It won't be enough if he just gives her a get because they already were living together, right? And he didn't do the mitzvah of Yibum yet. So you can't just give her a get and be done because get doesn't undo chi of Yibum. So get's not an option. Now, he would have to have relations with her again because he can't give her a get to get her out of it. He can't, right? It won't, it, he can get her out of the marriage with it, but it won't fulfill the mitzvah of Yibum. Chalitza nami lo efshar the miftera. I just skipped a little bit. Ho'il mikoma kom ba'aleha. You can't do chalitza because you have relations with her. Once you have relations with her, he's not allowed to do chalitza. Chalitza is only if you decide not to do anything with her. But he already did something with her, even though it's not a valid Yibum. It prevents him from doing chalitza with her. So basically, the only option is live olo tashnia, right? Another time. And therefore, Rish Lakish says, it's just obvious. You didn't even need to say it. Some people say that it was actually the reverse, the way the question went. So, makes sense to me. Again, all that was done retroactively is not valid. That's why it says Yikayen, which is telling you, you have to go back, have relations with her a second time to fulfill the mitzvah of Yibum, actually. And then you can stay married to her. Because there's no other possibility. According to you, there are possibilities. If he wants to, he can divorce her at this point. Because he already fulfilled Yibam according to you. So if he wants to, he can divorce her at this point. Or he can stay married to her. That's what it should have said, Mibayle. It should have said in the Mishnah, So Rish Lakish says, according to you, Rabbi Yochanan, the wording of the Mishnah doesn't match your opinion. So again, in Achinami, Rabbi Yochanan says, you really could have stay married to her, or you could have divorced her if you wanted, but just like Rabbi Yochanan said in the first one, it's just to match the language. In the first case, it said you have to immediately go, get to, you know, leave, split up, because if you don't split up, you can't stay married to her because it's Eshadach. So therefore, in this case, it said Yikayim, which was the opposite of Yotzi, and that's why. Okay, last question for today, Meitigim. Now the Gemara brings a question. So those were two mirror images, of right, taking parts of our Mishnah and kind of one reading them to prove his point and the other reading it to prove his point. 
Now we have a metive, a question from a brighter on Rabbi Yochanan. Exactly our case, right? He marries her, and then turns out she was pregnant. Okay, her tzara can't be married. Okay, he can't marry her tzarata. Because right, the tzara is stuck now, because maybe the child will, be, will survive. So now they say, wait a minute. The child will survive? If the child will survive, of course the tzara can go marry anyone she wants. So Adraba, Kiavi Vlad Ben Kayama, Miftira Tsarata. So they say, okay, wait, sorry, we made a mistake. The way the Brighter should read is Ela Ema Shema Lo Yehav Vlad Ben Kayam. If the Vlad is not Ben Kayama, the Yibum they did now is obviously not valid because the concern is that Tsara can't go get married yet because what in a, let's say that Tsara didn't get married right away. So now they did Yibum with one of the wives. Now the wife is pregnant. So now we don't know, right, who if uh, if the baby's going to survive. If the baby doesn't survive, then they're obligated in Yibam, and what they did originally doesn't work. That's Rish Lakish, that's against Rabbi Yochanan. According to Rabbi Yochanan, it should work fine. If you say that retroactively the Yibam will be valid, then the Sarah can go get married, because no matter what, she's permitted. So Amar Abaye, Abaye is now going to change Rabbi Yochanan, which Rav is not going to be happy with. Everyone agrees that you're not patur from Bi'ah. We're now changing Rabbi Yochanan to fit with this. If you do Bi'ah, you can't say retroactively it was good. Only Chalitza retroactively works. Rish Lakish Savar Bi'ah Muberet Loshma Bi'ah Vichalitza Muberet Loshma Chalitza. Rish Lakish holds, right, neither of them work. So I'm like, Rav, I'm not What are you talking about? Either way you look at it. They go hand in hand. Why do they go hand in hand? Last time for today. We've already learned that in order to do chalitza, it has to be there was potential for yibum. In order to do yibum, there has to be potential for chalitza. That means the two go hand in hand. That means if you say that retroactively the chalitza was good, you're going to have to say retroactively the yibum was good. So you can't say that to answer the question. And Rav is going to bring a different answer, which we'll see in our shiur tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone.